we go. We are recording and um, do an official welcome to Alison and Becky. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it'd be really great just to start the session hearing a little bit about um, the projects that we did with you for anyone who um, doesn't know anything about them, hasn't seen them, just to get a bit of an overview of what we did. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Everyone's I think very Becky fun. should go first because she was <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> so um hi uh, everybody my name is Becky I'm a writer um and I write for theatre but I also write for tv and for radio which I guess is probably relevant as we talk in terms of where the project came from and why it was a certain kind of theatre um so I wrote a play called Chip Chop Chips for Box of Tricks that first went out I think in like 2016 and then toured again a couple of years later and Chip Chop Chips was um, a kind of love story rom-com in tone and it was set in a fish and chip shop and it happened on what was supposed to be the opening night of this kind of family run fish and chip shop and the dad of the family had passed away and his sort of black sheep son had come back to reopen the family chip shop but he had a lot of ideas for kind of um, adding fried halloumi to the menu and making it a kind of trendy modern sort of fish and chip shop so the play took place on the night of the grand opening and because it was the grand opening and Eric the sort of central character had these ideas there was like a quiz there was kind of um I think he was going to do a disco at the end but then the events of the night went awry and that didn't happen so he was in a sort of MC role on the night so that he could therefore kind of do that as part of the performance and also as part of the performance the audience all a um a fish and chip supper so the piece was kind of very much constructed around the idea that you were here in his family chip shop for the opening night uh yeah hello everyone i'm alison uh, and i wrote um a play called the last quiz night on earth for box of tricks which was this sort of follow up from chip shop chips i guess they weren't not in terms of play or they weren't related in terms of character or world but it was in terms of a, a play for non-theater spaces um that was immersive um so last quiz night on earth was about the last quiz night on earth um so the world an asteroid is gonna hit the earth and the audience are invited to the four horsemen pub to spend their last night on earth doing the pub quiz. And it was a real quiz. The audiences were invited to play and they played it with great enthusiasm. <laughs> they did. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there was four characters. So was Kathy, the landlady, and Rav, the quiz master slash barman. And then there was Bobby, who was Kathy's estranged brother who turned up for um, end of the world, not really reconciliation, end of the world, things that needed to be said that wouldn't be able to be said. And Fran, who turned up, um, who was Rab's uh, girlfriend from when he was a teenager, who had decided that if she'd, if she'd been with him, then her life would have turned out very differently. And she needed to come and tell him that and declare her love. Um, but it didn't quite didn't quite go as she hoped it would. Um, it was written before COVID, um, obviously, but it wasn't written, you know, it was a fictional end of the world, uh, which was then cut short uh, <laughs> for other end of the world reasons. So the tour, it was touring uh, when the pandemic shut everything down. Um, so it didn't get to finish its tour, but it played a fair few venues um, in the first half of its tour. So we got a good sense of how it worked and a good sense of the sort of audience relationship uh, which is what I can talk about a little bit today. Yeah ah, thank you but um thanks for those great great overviews I guess um just to kind of add to that sort of introduction um we uh these are the only two shows that we've done in a kind of non-theatre space immersive fashion but we've done a, by the time we have remounted last because that which is going to happen um we will have done both twice we've will have taken them out twice to um rural touring networks and non-theatre spaces and uh, that was not a type of theatre that we knew that we wanted to do um until becky came to us with her idea 
for Chip Shop Chips that we were like, oh, we can't just do this in a theatre. It needs to be somewhere else. It'd be so lovely to have that experience of um, serving food and being present in a um, in a very different kind of way for an audience. And um, then doing it that first time, we had such a great time engaging with an audience in, in a different way, which we will talk about throughout the session, that we decided to do it again. Um, so uh, that, yeah. That's basically all that we've got for by way of an introduction. So I guess um, what would be really nice to talk about is uh, what immersive and interactive mean in terms of theatre. Um, what do we think? Um, I mean, for me, I'd never written a, anything like this before, um, which was evident in the struggle bus that I rode all the way to the first draft, <laughs> which I'll, I'll talk about later if people want to hear about it. <laughs> But I think, it, you know, for me, it meant uh, uh, there wasn't that separation. You know, you go to a theatre and the, the stage is lit and the audience are in darkness and you watch them in polite silence. Um, you are in you are all in the same space together. You're all in the same world uh, and you're all experiencing the same thing. Audience and character uh, in the same. You're all in a quit you're all in a pub at the end of the world you know you're all doing it together and that the audience have some sort of interaction participation there's a direct relationship between the audience and the play the audience are in the play um I don't know if it was the same for Becky because I know you came with the idea didn't you yeah so I came with the idea um having I'd been actually to see a show at the Bolton Octagon, and I don't know if people know it, but there's a kind of sit down chip shop opposite called the Olympus, which is a really nice big open space. And um, it was, it's just a really great people watching space. And I don't know what it was about that particular night, but there was something quite evocative about sort of the fish and chips and this being a very people watching environment. And I was like, oh, it would be really great to do a love story in a chip shop. So from the beginning of the idea, I sort of, felt it was a story about people watching and a story about kind of quite an everyday love story that you know that you might be sitting opposite someone on a table in a restaurant and there's something really dramatic for them playing out and you just kind of catch bits of it so that idea like Alison said that the audience that all the conversations that happen in the play you are privy to you know the actors aren't imagining the audience aren't there so the whole play is written to be constructed around the idea that these other people are present in this world too um rather than being a darkened room where the kind of actors are having their lives but the audience are more as if you were watching from behind a screen so that yeah that idea that we're all in the same world that no one's pretending the audience aren't there was kind of very much um there from the beginning of the concept I think. Yeah and I I mean talking from a director's point of view being in the rehearsal room is one thing but I imagine that it was the same thing for you that it's a nice degree of pressure to put your characters under that they're always on show that they you, you they can't be let off the hook about anything there's no private time there's no reflection time because there are people around them all the time and um, choosing the kind of characters who can who are really bothered about that public personal um, divide versus the characters who just don't give a shit and will say whatever in whatever scenario um, is an interesting kind of license to give yourself as playwrights. I think it can be a bit of a balancing act as well with that because you, you, you need your characters to say certain things. You need your characters to well, I did. I, let's not be general. I needed my character to <laughs> say and admit certain things for the for the story. Um, so, like, so, like you say, it was it was being able to justify them being aware that they are in a public space and that everyone is looking at them, and to sort of to 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 make that part of it rather than just be like, oh, well, for this bit, the audience we've forgotten that the audience are there and. I think for mine, because because it was the end of the world, I think the stakes were quite high. Um, so things things had to be said because they wouldn't get a chance to be said. They wouldn't be able to just go and have that conversation tomorrow mm. because the world was ending. So I think that's how how we were able to sort of justify those those bigger, maybe more emotional revelations. I, I don't know if it was the same for Becky, but just finding that balance. 
Yeah, I think definitely that balance between also because I think Chip Shop Chips, it kind of was also accepting when the audience wouldn't get something. I found that so there were some moments in it that actually only some members of the audience would watch some nights, but it felt to me like that was kind of important in a way, you know, that sometimes we'd be in rehearsals and I think for the actors that's quite gutting because they're like, well, we do this nice little moment and not everyone sees it. But for me, that's very much kind of part of it being immersive is that the audience are sort of actively having to follow the story as well and actively kind of judging where to look when and who to listen to when rather than it being kind of presented um and I think Chip Shop Chips got like Eric was a character the sort of central character who allowed things to get quite heightened anyway um but I think one of the challenges of the play was getting the stakes right so that it felt kind of like it could be any night in a ship shop and this is the sort of ordinary love story but also it feeling you know that was something that I think we wrestled with a lot is the balance between some moments being too big and actually some moments being you know is there enough story happening for this to feel like a play rather than just an immersive experience so I suppose that's interesting is that you know we spoke quite a lot about the kind of nights that you go to on like a works do or whatever that's a murder mystery and that actually is a theatrical and kind of immersive experience but um we also like as a playwright I also wanted this to have you know a degree of depth that said something that maybe those kind of experiences don't do so getting that balance right and actually what was interesting is I think some audiences saw a different show than other audiences because actually the sort of mood of the night was oh becky's oh. frozen hopefully she'll come back in a minute um and we I will hear <laughs> what she thinks of the mood of the night ah! <laughs> um but actually it um becky makes a really good point about the um the variety between the performances and the lack of control that you have over it. Um, it would be really nice while Becky is frozen in cyberspace and while we wait for her to come back. Um, it'd be really nice to throw it open to the rest of the room to kind of hear um, any, if you could chuck them in chat, um, any of the kind of obstacles and um, immediate questions and queries that you would have about creating immersive a theatre. What are the things that, um, that kind of, popped your head about um about what that would you know what it would entail um anything at all so I'm creating a little bit of a board of thoughts um uh about that sound a problem that is an excellent that is an oh excellent. yeah that was a question wasn't it with mine anyway yep how do you create the end of the world yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and allowing space for ad-libbing within the writing process that's a good point as well we can definitely talk about that we certainly can <laughs> um yeah tech do you want me to just answer these as they come in or try to or yeah yeah do my want, side of yeah, it we've anyway. got, yeah as we've got um and, and then out to, and anyone any other questions that are cropping up about it i mean um yeah I mean, in terms of, I guess, in terms of lighting and, and sound, um, there wasn't very much in your script at all, was there, Alison? No, I mean, I deliberately... Hi, Becky, welcome back. <laughs> I, um, I, um, I didn't write in very much lighting and sound because I knew that yeah. there wouldn't be any... Um, there wouldn't really be any, any scope for it um, because you are essentially going potentially going into like community centres, village halls, they're not going to have the setup. Um, or if you're in a theatre, like we were in a pub, if you're in a theatre, you're probably going to be in the theatre bar. So it, it just couldn't, it couldn't rely on any of that because it wasn't going to have it. Um, so I just didn't write it in. I mean, there was a, the very final spoilers, if you don't want spoilers for last week, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the very final sort of moment in last quiz now is the end of the world. Um, but to be, but by the time we got there, the you, you just hope that the audiences are on board and they've they've come along on this story with you. So and they understand, they know where they are and they understand that you can't have the ceiling fall in. Um, 
and you know they just kind of I think they went with it on the whole you know the lights went out <laughs> let's hope when the world ends it is that sort of calm <laughs> <laughs> quite jovial a lot of the time it, there was something yeah. really lovely in the collaboration of both pieces that we just couldn't really rely on smoke and mirrors at any point um because there's nowhere to hide and you know you might have um a, a backstage area but that is essentially a cupboard or a kitchen in a village hall or um so you can't you can't cheat anything and actually I think once you get your head around that um I think we had one effect in Becky's where we had like a panel a chip panel fire didn't we um and, but that was it so we had to you know, we had to work out a way of staging that but that was it everything else was was just there in front um I would say that both sound was really important to both of you in your pieces um in terms of music I mean do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah Becky do you want to yeah so we had a recurring motif so in the sort of there was like a um love story that was about a kind of a uh, couple who had been in love when they were 17 and they were seeing each other again for the first time in sort of 50 years um and there was a recurring that was a memory of like a fish and chips memory of when they were still together that kind of took us into um one of the characters had internal monarchs and the music kind of underscored those um, and it felt important, although I've said about wanting it to feel very people watching it, also playing with when it felt theatrical and when it felt kind of like a magical theatrical space as well. So we kind of used the music to support that throughout it. Um, and I think it worked. I mean, I think it would have been really nice, actually. We talked about having like a full on disco at the end. And I think, you know, but that wasn't always practical with the venues. But I think it definitely worked to give it something that felt kind of... Um, beyond a normal night out and the music kind of really lifted that and some that we did have a disco ball at some venues but again some venues you couldn't have it so it was kind of that balance of well what can we do to make this feel kind of magical and theatrical with quite limited resources and with an audience who aren't necessarily in a good way aren't always in the story that's unfolded between the characters wasn't always the most important thing to the audience and like from a writing perspective I think that's actually quite um like good if you know do you know what I mean it's like it's quite like they're here to have a good night out and we your work is supporting that hopefully but actually some people probably just had a nice fish and chip supper and a good time with their friends and that, that it's kind of accepting that in the work as well yeah, yeah I would 100% I mean you know for, for quiz night um the quiz was very popular people really <laughs> loved the quiz and a lot of people I think just came for the quiz which is fine but I think I had to reconcile myself with that and the fact that I had written a play <laughs> with the quiz in it um, um and, and for not everyone but for some audience the, the they were just fully invested in the quiz and if anything the play was an annoying um, thing that kept um, sort of coming in to, to their quiz night. Um, and just going back to the music that um, that Hannah mentioned, I did have quite a lot of like songs through throughout quiz night for the different rounds, uh, which was great fun in making the, the playlist. Um, and lots of, there's so many songs about the end of the world. <laughs> um, and when the audience would come in there was like a radio announcement playing that you know this is not a drill um you know a, a world ending event imminent you know yeah. thoughts and prayers there was a sort of just to get the audience not everyone would hear it, it wasn't blasting out but you know it was there to hear mm. if the audience wanted to hear mm. it just to set the set the tone yeah. and then we heard that again later on in the play just to emphasize that uh, just to remind the audience, I think, that the world is ending um, and that the sort of the situation wasn't improving because it, it wasn't a play about how do we save the world. It was a play about the world is ending and there's nothing we can do about it. So let's mm. go and do a quiz. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think same as what Becky said, like different audience members had different experiences and that's that's great. And I did learn to enjoy that but it just took a little bit of getting used to I think um because yeah. again like you're used to an audience sitting 
listening. <laughs> and not be able to see them all, you know, sitting yeah. in the dark. So even if someone is fidgeting or not paying attention, you can't see them. Um, I mean, from a technical point of view, the sound is a really good way of bringing people's attention back to what's going on. So mm. any of you who are kind of contemplating writing these kind of plays, actually put strategically having bits of music or sound in there as a kind of... Um, as a comma or a full stop for a you know a section, blocking off a unit, telling you that there's going to be a change and whatever, um, it's really good. And um, particularly with with both these plays, we chose like popular music. We had lots of Northern Soul with Becky's and with Alison's. It was kind of pop hits from the seventies, you know, onwards. So there was a, a really nice. Um, shared ground of cultural references for our audience they there was it was music that they recognized that um evoked certain feelings in them um we've got one other really good question which would be great to talk about now and then it'd be nice to talk a little bit about the development process for both but um what about how you allow space how you either write for or just allow breathing space for the improv and ad-libbing because um with both pieces there was a lot like we had you know, that happened, it was an inevitable part of every performance. But um, yeah, how did you aim off for that in the writing process? So or did we, did we even do it in the writing process or did we wait until we were in the rehearsal room? I think in, um, with Chip Shop Chip, so Eric was this sort of MC character. Um, and so he was always written as that. So it was always obvious that that person would have to do some improv so I don't think it was written in the script as in oh Eric improvs now but it was um sort of clear in when we were auditioning we knew we needed someone that the audience would feel in a sort of safe pair of hands with in that regard so someone and it was kind of um I think the challenge with Eric as a character who was the MC is he was also an alcoholic and as the night unraveled um his patter was unravelling in the script but actually that was quite hard for the actor I think sometimes because as the actor sort of in charge of the energy in the room he still sort of needed to be on it so that was so actually in terms of the writing of the script how that affected um, structurally the play is I then swapped to the MC was part way through so as Eric started to sort of unravel what happened was he kind of stormed off and another character who had been kind of more passive and on the people watchy type tables and a bit of a reluctant passenger on the night she sort of stepped up and took on the MC role in a way that was kind of about her character's journey so okay now she is happy to be like she's not embarrassed to be out with a nan and she's happy to be up on stage so I think um that was important in terms of making space to make it consistent with the characters through line so making the improv consistent with the characters through line and there were a couple of times you know like the show ran at completely different times in different oh, venues yeah. <laughs> sometimes the actor like was getting loads back from the audience and what did happen is you started to get a sense of um oh someone's going to answer back at this at this moment yeah. but actually what also happened that was interesting was that I had in the writing anticipated that Eric would have quite a lot of that sort of feedback and would be kind of because he was running the there was a, there was a quiz in Chip Shop Chips as well and because he was running the quiz that there would be some back and forth but what I hadn't anticipated is um some people on some nights spoke to all the characters like so you know there was like a bit where um I can't remember the character's name Chrissy in one of her monologues says like oh people need to be touched don't they and they need to feel something against their skin and pretty much every night another old woman would be like oh they do and sometimes they would <laughs> like reach out and touch her and yeah. so, but those kind of moments I hadn't really anticipated at all and you know one of the actors who played like a, a server in the restaurant people would literally just be in the middle of like a monologue and they'd be like asking him for ketchup or whatever <laughs> so some of those moments <laughs> I hadn't really made space for and then um you just I think so some of that was down to the casting and the rehearsal process to make sure that actually you were trying to make sure the actors felt safe with that and felt kind of you know understood that that was the the job in hand um yeah yeah I mean I think some similar stuff happened with quiz night I mean there were two characters in quiz night that 
directly that we knew would that I knew would have a sort of rapport with the audience. So you had Kathy, the landlady, who sort of kicked things off, and it was it was sort of her space. It was her pub. Um, we treated the audience like um, people that she knew, or at least you know a, a good many of them. It was written in that she would refer talk to people but call them by name obviously we didn't know their real names but she'd be like oh hey Colin hey Sally nice to see you. so there were as if there was a relationship there there was a recurring character his <laughs> name I've just forgotten Paul Paul how could I forget Paul <laughs> there was a character called Paul who we never met but who was that who was there sorry we did meet him but he was an audience member he was there and Kathy spoke to him as Paul but um she just picked someone and that was Paul. Uh, he never had to speak back. Some people did. Some people got very invested in the role of Paul. <laughs> yeah, they did. Uh, <laughs> but the, they were never. The, you know, they they didn't they they didn't have any sort of lines that they had to say or anything like that. Um, and then Rav, who was the quiz master, um, he probably had the most. And you know, obviously, I knew that the audience would have interaction with him because he was he was running the quiz. He was doing the quiz qu answers. He was doing the questions. Um, and I mean, um, the, the actor who played, it, it was, um, it was an evolution, I think for him and just in yeah. performance because he, they got really good at it, you know, how to, to be able to keep things running, yeah. but because he was the quiz master, you could treat the audience like quiz contestants. So you could, you could have that conversation with them, but like Becky says, with, it's with the casting and it, I, I imagine that's quite intimidating and it's, a, you know, it's confidence. Um, when I saw them do it, you know, they always they always dealt with it really well. There was one moment in the play, which I have, which in rewriting it for the re tour, I've, I've moved. But there was a really important piece of information that had to, for plot that people had to really ideally had to hear, and it was getting lost because it was of where it was in the mm. quiz. So the audience were like fully invested in whatever was happening in the quiz, and where I'd put this information. They just weren't hearing it because they they were still chatting about question two or whatever it was and I mean they would the, the cast were like literally having to be like can everyone just settle down <laughs> just listen I think that Kathy has something, has something to say to <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were really really having to work hard bless them um to, to get this information across which is why I've now moved it um because what I did learn was if you're doing a quiz based play put any important information in the section where they're being given the answers because yeah. the audience are listening really carefully because they want the answers because they want to play the quiz. Yeah. Um, but like I went to the first dress rehearsal, which was in the pub where the preview was. And it was the first time they'd done it in front of an like in situ, oh, audience, yeah. in front of an audience doing the play for real, not just in front of me and Hannah who knew when to be quiet and, we would play the quiz but like not really we knew the answer you know we knew the answers um and it was a baptism of fire <laughs> i mean they all it was it was intense um but it was you know that's what it was like and i think i think they came to to love it i mean the progress the evolution in it that i saw was, yeah, yeah. was really impressive you know you, you learn to find that balance of getting the information across yeah, is, it's, you know, it's not a job that that every actor could do. No, not a job. No, Casting is, um, yeah, is a diff is a different thing. But um, let's talk a little bit about process, and because um, there was definitely a different emphasis on the role of the audience in that in the writing process that we, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have, um, and haven't had in the shows um, that you. That you've written um let's let's hear a little bit about that i mean i know becky that you had um a particular process that we wanted to go down and exploring chip shop chips do you want to talk about that a little bit yeah so when so so i kind of had this idea in a chip shop that oh it'd be good to do a people watching you play in a chip shop and it felt really obvious to me that it would be a play about um first love and a play about kind of that like first going out for a meal when all you can afford is like a bag of chips between you but then I was quite aware that I was like well is that just what I associate you know that the kind of nostalgic thing is that a is that a me thing and is that actually kind of the real feeling about chip shops and so 
from quite early on in the process I knew that I wanted to do some workshops with kind of people who don't so some of well so people the the idea was that always through doing it in a chip shop it would appeal to audiences who wouldn't necessarily go and watch a new writing play in the studio of a theatre so maybe audiences who would maybe go to a musical or maybe go to kind of something quite um safe you know something that they'd feel confident going to but that wouldn't necessarily go and see a sort of new writing play or maybe wouldn't go to the theatre at all but maybe would be kind of very engaged in tv drama or kind of uh, other art forms so we knew that that was eventually going to be the audience. So as part of the process of writing the play, it felt important to do some kind of workshops with the kind of people we'd be hoping to take the play to. So we did um, workshops with kind of various young people's groups and community groups to kind of get a sense of what fish and chips meant to different people of different generations and what fish and chips meant to the kind of audiences that we'd be taking the show to. So we did some kind of participatory workshops and then I think all I knew at that point at the start of the workshops was that I wanted it to be a love story set in a chip shop. So we did lots of exercises that were exploring kind of fish and chips memories and also first love memories. And then after those is when I kind of started to write the show. Um, but it wasn't like a verbatim show. So the idea wasn't that I would directly kind of take stuff from the workshops. It was more to get a feel for kind of whether my instincts about what this setting meant to people were right. And I think if you're writing an immersive play where the location is really important, um, for me, that felt quite important to tap into what that place means to other people as well. So what people are kind of immersed in, what that, you know, you're putting them in a particular world, but what does being in that world mean to them as opposed to what being in that world means to you? Um, and we got some really nice little nuggets. And in fact, there was one bit where in one of those workshops, someone talked about how um, the lady who'd owned the chip shop near her had been called Lily Ricketts. And I was like, oh, Lily Ricketts is such a nice name. I, just, and I just put that in and attached it to a different story about fish and chips. And then we were touring somewhere else in Lancashire and someone came up and Lily Ricketts was like her aunt or something. And she was like, my auntie, Lily, my auntie's called Lily Ricketts. And she ran the chip shop. And she literally couldn't kind of, believe it so we did get some nice little nuggets and we did very much get um and it's always impossible to know like did, did did we get those responses because those were the questions we were asking but we did definitely get a lot of stuff that was about that nostalgia kind of cozy you know what fish and chips meant to people um and we also actually in the course of the show there was then an opportunity for the audience to also share their own like so the audience kind of did some of those exercises as part of the show and then they were incorporated into another bit in the show yeah which was lovely um and uh, gave a whole other level of interactivity and actually um collecting up collecting those up after the end of each show like the honesty and vulnerability that some people would show in these little, tiny little cards. Um, should we do an exercise, Becky? Should we talk about a way of unlocking um, memories and thoughts and accessing, accessing yeah. the beginning of a piece? Um, let's have a go. Let's do something practical. Okay, great. So, so actually, if you're working on something that's set, you might want to kind of slightly reshape these questions like if you're here because you're working on something that's set at a village bay or set at a, then I guess you could think of a way to rework these into um that settings but if you haven't got that then maybe you could do them about chip shop um so actually and just to say in terms of how we use these stories I don't think we can do this exercise because of zoom but I did an exercise in the workshops where people would tell a memory or a story to a partner and then they'd have like two minutes or whatever to share and then after the two minutes you would tell the story you just heard but as if it had happened to you and so on kind of passing each other's stories and memories on and then we'd hear them back and talk about kind of how they'd evolved and changed and how stories have merged into each other and I use that as a way to kind of establish with the group that I might be taking their stories, but they wouldn't be their stories anymore. So it's kind of so that you're letting people know that anything they offer up 
is not so precious to them that, that it can't be changed because sometimes it's like um you don't want people to feel like you're using something that's really kind of you know theirs um but I think I was trying to think of a way we could do that on zoom and I was like I don't think there's a way to kind of no no pass it along on but zoom it's a it's a really really lovely exercise and um I one when, when the show was up and running I went to some community groups and did some um workshops on the themes of the play and actually I think before the second outing of it I think I went I went and ran some um and it was an exercise that I used in those groups which was, was really lovely and um yeah did a really nice job of just exploring the nature of storytelling and how you can um use something factual but then create something new and imaginary of it um and if people would be interested in in knowing, learning more about that exercise, um, let me know because actually, Becky, we can we can send that in an email to anybody afterwards, can't we? Just a little um, yeah. outline of that. So if you do want it, just um, send me a little message in chat, um, and I will make sure that we send you an email with that after the event. Um, but did we have another exercise? Yeah. We... So this is a sort of speed. I'm gonna. I'm just getting the timer up on my phone. This is a kind of speed exercise, and the idea of doing it under sort of timed conditions is so that there you don't um, you don't agonise or perfect your thoughts. It's just about getting out your kind of first things that come into your head. Um, so I'm gonna say two minutes. And to write down, so I'm going to say, I, I will always say chip shops, but you could change it to whatever the world of your play is, if there's something you're working on. So two minutes to write down all the smells associated with chip shops. So all the smells that you associate with chip shops. And I'm going to time two minutes. And then I'm so going to throw something else in after two minutes. Are we doing minutes. this individually on pieces of paper or in Individually the on pieces of paper. Piece of paper. And if you can't think of any, what I always say is um, just write, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. <laughs> and you become unstuck. So the idea is to be writing continuously for two minutes. Okay, that's two minutes. So what I'm, oh, my, my time is <laughs> one, one of my children chose that. <laughs> um, so now exactly the same thing, but this time for sounds. So two minutes on the sounds you associate with fish and chips. And when I say fish and chips, I might not mean in a fish and chip shop. So it might be that loads of people talked about swimming. So it might be that actually, what do you think of fish and chips? You think of the bus ride home or you think of, you know, so sounds that you associate with chip shops, but it might not be like sounds that actually happen in a chip shop, if that makes sense. There's no kind of right or wrong, but so two minutes. And uh, then two minutes on um, feelings that you associate with fish and chips. And by feelings, I mean both feelings like textures and things that you can touch and feelings like emotion. So, so both kinds of feelings for two minutes. That's kind of like a speed warm up. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit longer now, but still not too long, maybe six minutes to write your um, earliest fish and chips memory, your best fish and chips memory and your worst fish and chips memory. So your earliest, your best and your worst. Um, and it might be that you don't have, it's fine if you haven't got one for any or all of those and actually um, there was a character who that was who the the chip shop owner kept pressing him for a fish and chips memory. He was like, I haven't got what you know. So it's also that's also that's also fine. Um, so yeah, your earliest, your best, and your worst chip shop memory or fish and chips memory. <laughs> Whenever it makes that sound, my youngest just like pasta's ready. I was like, it's not, it's not always pasta. Um, <laughs> so, um, and in those exercises, we did them with the groups and then shared round before the writing process. And then what I also did during the writing process, and and we also explored some other stuff in those workshops. So we asked things about. 
actually the other thing I knew is I knew I wanted it to be a love story set in a chip shop and I also knew that I wanted it to be intergenerational and there to be an older love story and a younger love story um but I didn't know what either of those stories was yet so in those workshops I also asked some questions of the older people that we worked with sort of like what advice would you give to someone falling in love for the first time what what advice would you give to your 16 year old self and then for the workshops with teenagers we asked you know what advice what what, what how did we phrase it something about what would you want to hear from your 60 year old self and then also something about falling in love for the first time um and then we also asked both sets of groups whether they thought it was harder to be a teenager today or to be a teenager 50 years ago so we did some stuff around broader themes as well as just talking about fish and chips but with the fish and chips exercises what um we also did what I did also is I did them for myself as well so I did all of them for myself except for with the memory one a version of it where um you and I do this sometimes as a character exercise as well you set yourself quite an ambitious target so to write like 30 in 10 minutes so to write like 30 fish and chips memories in 10 minutes or and so you're pushing yourself to kind of really go deeper than you think is there so I did that for myself and also for every character in the play so for every character in the play I got them to do these exercises as if they were in one of the workshops so for every character I wrote their chip shop smells and sounds and feelings and and memories um, and some of those made it directly into the script so talking about what you remembered was quite a big and nostalgia was quite a big theme of the play as well so some of them made it directly into the script but some of them just sort of filtered into the ether of it um, I don't know if anyone wants to share I don't know if there's the kind of exercises anyone wants to share anything no or if anyone on. I mean we've, we've got you know a comment in the in the message that it like it unlocked memories and stuff that you hadn't thought of for for a long time, which I think is um, it, it's the point of the exercise in lots of ways. But actually, I'm really glad that you expanded on it a bit there, Becky, because actually, what I think is really great about that exercise and how it develops is that not only is it a really accessible, really lovely one to do with community groups and you know non non professionals because it is really straightforward and can be shaped around different stuff like you could totally do that about like football or the cinema or the seaside or you know like loads of different things that are, that feel you know kind of universal experiences um but also it's a nice one that you can make yourself as a writer do or do as character exercises if you know if to give you to give that really strong grounding and actually it could even be something that if you were so minded and had enough time in rehearsals, you could make your actors do as the characters. Because we did actually, do it with the actors. Yeah, did you? Yeah, oh, we did brilliant. Do it with the actors. I'd forgotten that. You're saying it. We did it with the actors. And we, because we did a week's R&D with actors as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And we did it at the R&D. And then I think we did it at the start of rehearsals as well. Because actually that, what you're saying about making sure that the actors feel really confident and really comfortable with their roles and with the world so that they can then ad lib and deal with drunken audience members or people who are just super chatty and um, actually they, they've done all that work and you've you've helped them through it and it's um there's something quite valuable about those being collective exercises that you do as a group rather than you know sending everyone home to do it separately and um, actually it's nice how they all feed into each other um thank you has anyone has anyone got any thoughts they want to share i mean feel free to turn your camera on and talk to us if you want to or just stick it in the chat um we've got a nice message here thank you from ellen it's amazing what you associate with such simple things like fish and chips that you wouldn't even realize you associate with them um oh interesting do it with places with negative associations that's interesting isn't it um i bet if you did one about like school um that would be a different that would be a different thing wouldn't it or be interesting to see the places that would that would flag up negative associations um, and also it's interesting you could do it from a writer's perspective if you knew you wanted to to create an immersive piece of theatre but you didn't so so with chip shop chips I knew I wanted it to be in a chip shop and that was the starting point but equally you could have thought I want to create a play that's exploring nostalgia and then you sort of flip it round and you think oh what are all the places that make me think of nostalgia do you know what I mean or so like with the do it with negative associations it's interesting that you could think 
oh, what are the places that make me feel dread and then try and explore you know what they are for various people and are there kind of common places like the, you know a school hall or whatever what are the places that kind of so I guess you could also think of an immersive piece that way round. Yeah that's really interesting isn't it that's really interesting um one to put in the back pocket for future future <laughs> writing workshops um I'm just having a look at the because we the things that we chatted about before in are there any bits the really important points or things that we haven't already covered in the conversation that you two would like to chat about now or um or should we open it up to questions I didn't know if there's anything that we felt we hadn't covered I mean I don't know if it's worth like I didn't do any of the stuff that Becky did. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, you, you know, you, you don't, you can go into it. There's not only one route into it, I think. Yes. You, know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to do, um, and that's not because I'm fundamentally against that kind of work. It's nothing like that. It just wasn't the process that, that last quiz night, you know, went through. It, it, we, it was a different route in, I think, because obviously Becky came with the idea already and the the um, the nature of it was born out of the idea, whereas I was commissioned to write a immersive play um, with a cast of no more than four that could tour to non-theatre spaces. So it was sort of the, the, the idea had to fit into the brief rather than the other way around, which is kind of so mine was like the flip to Becky's I guess um and and like I said before like I really really struggled um to find an idea partly because Becky had used every single possible thing you could do in a play in my mind <laughs> she, had, she had bingo she had food she had a quiz she had a raffle <laughs> she had everything and I was like there's nothing left um and obviously I was, I, I didn't see Chip Shop Chips because the performance I was due to go to was snored off. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so I read it. I did read it, but I hadn't seen it. So I, I was aware of what had come before, but I didn't want to repeat anything. And, you know, it needed to be, it obviously needed to be different. Um, I couldn't just do the same. Um, so I, re I really struggled to find my way in and what that would be and, it was quite a long and torturous process, um, as Hannah will remember. <laughs> but um, I think eventually I, I stopped trying to reinvent the wheel. I stopped trying to come up with something that had never been seen on a stage ever, never, ever been, you know. Um, and, and, I just, and I kept going back to pub quiz and I just, I couldn't think of, it's been done, you know, pub quiz plays have been done. I, I'm not pretending that I invented them. But what, you know, what could I bring? What what was me? What was my style? What was I interested in that I could bring? And then that end of, you know, the end of the world, which sort of is smacks of me, <laughs> the kind of thing that I'm <laughs> interested in writing about. Um, and like Becky was saying, you know, she knew she wanted it to be a love story. She, you know, you, you, I had these kind of um, sort of pegs that I knew that I, that I wanted or, or maybe more things that I didn't want I, I didn't want Kathy's you know Kathy was the landlady I didn't want her story to be that she had to find love and that at the end of the world and that was what was going to make her happy like I, I didn't want it to be that I didn't that's not the message that I wanted to have um but I didn't do any I didn't do any sort of the workshops I kind of wrote it in a fairly standard way that I would write a play I, I, I sat down and I wrote it um, which sounds a lot easier than it was, but I also I also had an R and D like week R and D with actors yeah. to hear it and start. But it was pretty. It didn't go through a huge amount of redrafting. Once it was sort of there, it it, it was quite straightforward after that. Um, but yeah, that's just to say that it doesn't. You know, there are different ways into it. And yes, no yeah. right or wrong way to to do it. And I think you raise a good point there. Actually, not. Um, this kind of theatre that is, I would say, <clears throat> much more audience-led and audience-centred than, um, a tr you know, um, theatre in traditional theatre spaces, doesn't have to do something brand new, doesn't have to, you know, actually it can tell universal stories and universal experiences in it, because what, 
you're bringing it to its right as, as Alison is, is your own stamp to it, but also it changes every single night because of the space and the people in it in a way that traditional theatre doesn't. It's obviously traditional theatre is a live art form and you're influenced by the energy of the room, but there's still a divide, there's still a fourth wall there. And actually, as soon as you remove that fourth wall, God knows what'll happen. You know, you kind of just throw yourself out into like, ah, we don't know, you know, and, and some nights, like, both, both projects, where I'd sit in a performance and there'd be somebody who would resolutely sit with their back to the performers throughout. <laughs> um, often a man, not that I'm making any aspersions against the type of man who, uh, who would come often with his wife to those shows. Um, but it's just that, you know, like an audience member going, no, I'm not an audience member. Um, in fact, I remember that show that we saw, Alison, in um, oh, wherever it was, up, um, up near Morpeth, wasn't it, that we watched where there was a guy and we could see him he was sat there and he didn't look at the actors once but we could see him and we were like why is he not telling that um and there's it's a very interesting um experience relinquishing control um, yeah i mean i saw quiz night quite a few times and it was different every time like i always went in with a sense of like oh my god like what what it, exciting you know what is it going to be tonight like how how are the audience going to be how invested are they going to be in the quiz at home how invested they're going to be in the characters, how's the, how are they going to interact with the cast. Um, it was great, it was great fun. It I mean, it's like nothing else. Oh yeah, yeah, it, it's, um, that's why we keep doing it. Um, yeah, we have yeah. got a question in the chat about props. Um, Adiam, I hope, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Do you want to pop up and ask that question or feel free to stick it into um, chat and I can, um, I can well, ask it on your behalf. Hi. Um, hi. Can you yeah, yeah, we can hear you, yes. Fab. Um, I was going to type it in, but it seemed a bit convoluted when I wrote it. Thank you very much for those insights. Definitely an interesting exercise to do. Um, but in terms of props, I was thinking if it's an interactive um, element, you know, there's things that people might put in their pocket accidentally, <laughs> they might take it home, you know, uh, but beyond the obvious where it's like you need a pen if there's a writing bit to it, how do you put props into your script, not just in the uh, rehearsal where you realize, you know, when you're ad-libbing or improv but literally when you're planning it out and you think this might evoke spe specific feelings in people um, and, you know, you might have to source it specifically. Uh, for me, I'm thinking about it like culturally. I'm Eritrean and there's certain things that we have to bring from Eritrea in, in East Africa for a show that I'm considering doing some R&D for. But I mean, uh, when you write it in your script, do you put it in as a, if it's possible, can we have this prop? Or do you actively want it there because it's going to be used hopefully by the audience? Um, I think that's a good question. I think one of the main things that I <clears throat> would do differently if I did Chip Shop Chips again, would be have less props than a smaller set for the size, for, for the venues we were touring to. So because it was a touring show, um, and the actors were already being asked a lot in terms of controlling the audience um, and being on their feet every night. It also had quite a big set and a lot of props and a lot of sort of food related, like certain ketchup containers that, that felt really evocative of the kind of chip shop it was meant to be. But it meant the sort of get in and get out for the actors was really arduous, I think. And, you know, they were brilliant. But I think that would probably be the one thing I would do differently is kind of be less. They had they had a lot of business as well actually yeah. in chip shop chips because be, because two of them were the staff of the yeah. restaurant actually they did need to be involved in laying the tables and they did have to bring out extra ketchup containers and salt and vinegar and then they had to take the food had to be served the food had to all be cleared away and then we had a um a brief quiz and a hat making competition so all the props for the hat like all the stuff to make the hats had to come out all that had to go back again um and they were really good at it i mean in in terms of the um stuff that was really evocative actually a lot of that was much more about the set so we had like a prop and and likewise i would say for last quiz night actually um when we weren't in actual chip shops or actual pubs we had um if it's based on the same set sustainability um we've had like a, a kind of counter so it was a chip shop counter for becky's and that and it's a, currently a bar and those that was dressed with stuff that felt very evocative so we had like cans of pop and like a great big jar of pickled eggs for um the chip shop and sauces and stuff like that 
and then for the pub we had like a big thing of scampi fries and like a little box of mars bars and like optics and different stuff so it felt very much um a world that the audience would recognize but there wasn't much that they were interacting with um i did i mean i when we were um, commissioning these plays we went to see some rural touring shows to get our head around what that experience was um, when I say we, me, me and Adam and we saw a really interesting show that was about food and I don't know whether um, that, 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 that was about a, the sensory relationship with food and actually small bits of there were like four sort of four sections of the play that talked about four different types of food or drink and the audience got given a little bit of that at each time like there was like so a little bit of whiskey and a little bit of ginger cake and like a date I think or something like that and some honey I think even um I can't remember but uh like that was really interesting getting given those tiny little morsels that were consumable so you didn't have to worry about them about getting them back um but yeah, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting question, actually, that how, how interactive do you allow it to be with stuff? Um, and I think, well, I think in general in writing, I, like, I think props feel quite important to me because as, as you said, they're very significant. But I think it's about trying to, like, if you really need it, you really need it. And then if you don't, you don't like, and because I work in telly sometimes as well, sometimes you forget, you know, you'll write something into a script in telly and kind of not really, you just think, oh, it might be nice for them to be doing this at this moment or have this at this moment. And the art department will take that really seriously and kind of go to a lot of effort to source it or whatever. And then you'll be like, oh, I don't actually need that. You know, that wasn't actually. So I guess the thing with props and that is true of a rural touring show is if you really need it be really clear about why you really need it so I think um I mean I think the set was beautiful for chip shop chips and actually we did really need to evoke that it was a certain kind of chip shop but it did you know logistically make it maybe more challenging than it needed to be for the actors yeah I think there's an interesting um conversation to be had about the uh, like the balance between props and set as well and actually how much of what you want to achieve can be done through set and stuff that the audience can look at and possibly mm -hmm. touch on their way in or out and have you know maybe there's a bit of space within the performance that that they can interact with that stuff but it's not necessarily sat with them the whole time I mean we lost a lot of pens and pencils <laughs> people yeah, will walk off with pens and pencils so anything that is you know no one nicks a ketchup bottle but actually anything that is sort of small enough that that you might forget that it's special. Um, I think it's like it's not overwhelming an audience as well, isn't it? Like we we know what we're going to ask of them, but they don't. You know, they're they're walking into this space, and they don't. And not everyone wants to be Paul. You know, not everyone. That's why we didn't ask anything specific of audiences in in quiz night. I mean, there were a couple of things in the script where a character would ask a team or a table of people a question and they you know a, fa a very simple question it wasn't anything to reveal anything about their deep dark secrets it was just like some silly little questions about the quest the quiz or whatever that they would you they would usually answer or someone on the table yeah, yeah. Would name. but I think it's just it's not asking too much of your audience as well not putting too much pressure on them to make it work because that's a lot of responsibility and like, and like Hannah says like some people don't want to face the stage <laughs> some people don't want to engage so you're you're setting yourself up quite a treacherous road I think if you ask too much of your audience you have segued beautifully into the next <laughs> question I was going to ask from the chat listen which <laughs> is um what what's the most important thing to consider in terms of working audience participation into your play um they might not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might not want to. Or they won't necessarily do what you think they're going to do. You know, they are unpredictable, I think. Yeah. Um, we worried a lot with both shows about people not joining in. I remember having a lot of worries about what if no one makes the hats in Chip Shop Chips? Oh my God, what if nobody does? And actually, by the time we came to last quiz, I was like, it's fine, they will join in. And even if the person you are to join in doesn't, someone else probably will um but it's that uh I mean I would say that the one thing that we have learned as makers is that it's really good to have open dress rehearsals if you can because that's where the actors get to try out that audience participation and see some of the things that might happen so if you were in a position 
when you're making a show that's like that to get and even if those those open directors are basically just a load of your mates you know or if you know community groups or whatever who can come in or students um that's really helpful any any other thoughts about audience participation i think um yeah as Hannah said, we really worried about people not joining in and actually people joined in a, a lot. <laughs> um, and I think and and I think really being aware of what you're asking the actors, because there was, you know, after that, it's Chip Shot Chip sounds like such a mad show when you talk about like the hat making competition, <laughs> but the hat making competition was around in the quiz. And um, straight after the hat making competition, one of the actors, goes, who the, the, she plays a widow and she goes into an internal monologue that's about grief and about losing losing her husband and sort of from a from a writerly point of view, I really liked it that people were still wearing silly hats and still talking about silly hats and then she was talking about grief because to me that's you know that's what grief is if you know what I mean like grief is your feeling that even when everyone else is messing around wearing a silly hat but actually for the actor that was a really really difficult ask so when the show went out again we just slightly modified the script to leave a bit more space in between mm. those moments so I'd say be aware of that if you're inviting an audience participation when you leave space after like that they won't just stop when you want them to necessarily and so what are those kind of segue moments um and also trying to find ways, if you can, for people to engage on their own level. So in Chip Shop Chips, there was some bits where people could write things down, but they, they might not want to offer it verbally. So trying to kind of layer in your participation so that people can engage in their own level. Um, and it was a challenge, I think, for audiences. Some, some nights, you know, there'd be some audiences who really wanted to listen to that speech about grief and some audiences who were still. So actually trying to foster an environment where the audience have also kind of aware of the rules with each other you know what I mean so sometimes you'd get people like really tutting at someone else who was joining in but actually you'd be like well we've invited them to join in so so just making sure you're not putting your audience in a position where they're antagonizing each other either which I guess is about building the space around those moments I think was something I learned yeah definitely um I'm mindful of time, lady. So um, I'm gonna, well, we've got a couple more questions in the chat, one of which I can answer very quickly um, in, about reading the plays. Last Quiz Night on Earth is published and available, um, published by Nick, 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 Nick Books, Nick, yes. Um, but Box of Tricks is very happy to um, sell you as many copies as you like to give to all the people that you love for Christmas. <laughs> um, the quiz is in it, but it's not the quiz that's in the show, so don't there's buy a, it. And there's I a mean, new quiz. Yes. If you saw last quiz night already, come back. There's a brand new quiz. quiz. I used lockdown wisely. Yeah, so you can't yeah. cheat. So you can yeah. buy it, enjoy the play, but not cheat on the quiz. Um, and Chip Shop Chip, sadly, we never got published, but we have, um, it, it exists um, as a digital copy. So um, it's kind of up to Becky as to whether she's happy for people to have a read of that. Um, but if, if that's something that people in terms of developing shows would be interested to, do you feel free to just um, email um, Box of Tricks after the event and we can... Um, put you in touch to help help those conversations progress and age the development of some more wonderful plays um ellen you had a question about um immersive theater please um give us a wave and ask your question if you if you're happy to turn your camera on or at least you might Hello. Hello. can you see me okay yes just checking yeah um I, like i won't take up too much time with it um but i just wanted to ask because i've not used immersive theater like at all as a medium, which is why I wanted to kind of come here to talk about it. Um, but a lot of the work that I write is quite socio-political, like it's quite politically motivated. And I know a lot of people have kind of said, oh, be careful if you want to make something that's socio-political, that's also immersive because you don't want to like lighten it too much. And if you're using something immersive, then you're going to kind of ruin your point by making it kind of too lighthearted. Um, but I was wondering like what your thoughts on that are and whether maybe there is a kind of power in using immersive theatre to make those statements or whether you think it's kind of would interfere and just hear your thoughts on that as a medium in that kind of way. I mean, I don't think immersive theatre has has to be or is a light-hearted medium I think um I think Chip Shop Chips and Quiz Night like they both talked about you know big big things just because you're in a pub or a chip shop it doesn't mean that you're just fluffy you know you're not saying anything y you are and if anything yeah, inviting the audience into that. that conversation you're not hectoring at them you're inviting 
you know, a point of view and in a space that is welcoming and that is for everyone. Okay. I mean, I don't know what Becky thinks, but. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. That I guess, um, and in a way, actually, you might get a more, like, I think what I think can work really powerfully about immersive theatre is people are, you know, on the nights it works really well, people are really in it and will really engage with whatever you, so this, I did another show that was, um, it wasn't quite immersive in the same way, but it was on Chorley Market, which is like a market town in Lancashire, and um, the audience, you know, it was about a market stall, and it was about a kind of whether this trader was going to lose their market stall, and she had an argument with her mum, and her mum was very sort of like, you know, the market's going to be gone in 10 years' time, go and work in a supermarket, and was quite, um, you know, anti sort of she thought her daughter was wasting her life still working there or whatever and there was a bit where we had a night where all the traders from the market came to watch and there's a bit where the girl says to her mum well what have you ever done with your life and this lad he was only about 10 just stood up and really shouted he was like yeah what have you ever done with your life and I think the actor was quite like like um I think it felt very nice for her but because I think people are in it so I think it's worth being aware of, you know, if you're inviting people to respond, then they might respond and the ways they respond might not be what you're expecting. And but I think that can be really sort of powerful. Like, I think that's where it's really powerful is they feel like they're there and you're talking to them. But I guess the only thing is if you're going to invite people and you're going to talk to them, then you need to know they're going to talk back and the ways they talk back might be unpredictable and might be. But I think that's really about the actor's and making sure you cast the right actors and actors who can kind of handle that and make it feel like the audience are in a safe pair of hands, even when the night's unpredictable. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's something really, uh, you know, really powerful about the potential of having an overtly socio-political play in that kind of setting, because it becomes a conversation that doesn't become didactic or preachy or any of those things that theatre can often be criticised of being in terms, you know, in terms of talking into, um, in, into an echo chamber. Actually, you know, you're potentially going taking a set of views and ideas into a space where your audience might not agree with you, and then it does become a, then then it becomes a conversation, doesn't it? Even if that conversation is not part of the performance, you know, we. Um, with both shows, we had audience feedback surveys as part of um, the show because we wanted to explore the demographics of audiences. And actually, um, we had a really, really good hit rate of um, audiences filling them out, partly because we had the nice design and stuff. But the feedback that we got was totally unfiltered, um, you know. And and I, I, we did one performance of Chip Shop Chips. We did two. Um, like an older people's group so they were like 70 to like 95 and there were some comments there of all oh, I'm just not sure about the subject matter because you're talking about grief and you know terminal illness and a lot of people in this room have lost you know their partners and I was like yeah that yes that's why we're doing it um that that's the point of it and actually you know um I knew people who saw that show not long after um they had lost people to cancer as you know as the show talks about and actually that, so something that doesn't feel political, doesn't feel, you know, contentious. So it was felt so keenly in that space, the audience members were worrying about other people, but then that's quite a lovely thing to create it anyway, where they're so in it and they're so aware of the emotion that is, that is swelling around the room. I think if you can harness that in the right way, then great, start the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Good question. Um, so yeah, I think unless there are any final questions, we'll we'll wrap it up there um, and allow everyone to kind of get on with their evenings. But thank you, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Alison and Becky, for your honesty and thoughts and opinions. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to chat to you. So thank you for giving me part of your evening. Um,